This edition of Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. The website is offplanetradio.com. I'm Randy Moggins. With me is Emily Moyer, my co host and producer. And uh, what we have today is going to be a fascinating discussion on a wide spectrum of topics. We have with us as our guest today, Crow Triple Seven. You can find him at Crow Triple Seven Radio.com and the YouTube channel. Uh, youtube.com forward slash user crow triple seven he's also on facebook as crow triple seven and um we're going to kind of uh go through a a whole spectrum of things today with crow and with emily and myself that relate to uh, some current events but before that we're gonna we're gonna find out a little bit about our guest he is known as crow that's spelled c Double R O W, triple seven, and uh, Crow. Welcome to Off Planet Radio. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. And Emily, you know, feel free to speak up there. You, you know, you're welcome. <laughs> I'm I'm a little under the weather, guys. So maybe I'll speak a little less today than you. No, usual. no, no. Can't let that happen. <laughs> Which I'm sure will be a welcome relief for some people. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, I'm super glad to have Crow. I've been a Crow. I've been a fan of your work for a really long time, and the. the the topic of the conversation about having you on has come up many, many times, but sometimes we just wait for the right impulse to do it. And Randy said now, so welcome. We're really happy to have you. Um, just, just in case, I think all of our listeners are familiar with at least some segment of your work, but if you just want to give a quick background on uh, who you are, what you're doing and how you got into this, um, that would be great. Thank well, you. I think, I think most people started to, I kind of got a cult following uh, when I filmed the Lunar Wave in 2012. I didn't post it online till 2013, but that's really where it started. And uh, when I did film the Lunar Wave and came to understand a short while later what it probably meant, um, I began to do a lot of telescope work. And that's where most people picked up my work. Um, I've had to move for family reasons. And I had a year here where I wasn't really able to film very much. Um, as we come into this spring of 2017 here, I will be doing more telescopic work. I can't film nonstop like I was in San Diego at one point, but I will be producing more work of that kind. Um, as time went on, I was asked to do some interviews. Um, Greg Carlwood of the Higher Side Chats or THC had me and it just got really popular really quick. Um, and so I launched my own podcast and that's basically where most people follow me right now. Um. Give us a little bit of background, because obviously you come at this from a perspective that reveals that you've done a lot of introspection, searching. Um, everybody has an awakening story, and I always like to hear them from the personal side. So tell us a little bit about your progression, the, maybe the big aha moment, uh, how, you, how you see and view the truth movement and a little bit of your background in working with telescopes, photography, HD video, and some of your earlier discoveries. Well, I'll tell you what, um, I was a child of the 70s, so <laughs> let me take one part of that at a time and you can ask me what's next because I've already forgotten yep. about three of the things. Oh, that's you okay, so my, I already <laughs> blurted it out. That's what we do here, we blurt it out because we know in the next second we're probably gonna forget it, it's the goldfish effect. So yeah, <laughs> Okay, so where do you want me to start there? Just, just tell us a little bit about your progression into, well, you know, the higher, the higher knowledge. I mean, it's very obvious listening to you that you, you kind of know, you kind of know what's shaking. You know that there's something wrong and you're trying to, trying to figure out what that, that is. Okay, um, you got to be disappointed because I never had an aha moment. Um, the, no, the not way, disappointed. Way, yeah, the way it actually worked for me 
Um, it was a bit like the Chinese water torture, but each time I was getting hit with a new drop, um, I was already aware somewhere in my mind that if the things that I knew were true, then how could you accept any of it? But if I go all the way back to my late teens, I was just one of these kids that wouldn't go along. I did horribly in school. I was the son of a professor, a PhD, um, who was all about education. Um, as a matter of fact, the biggest education in my life probably came from growing up in a household with one of the smartest men I ever knew, mm -hmm. scholastically and otherwise. Um, what finally began to happen in my 20s was I began to view things as, why are we doing this? It makes no sense. Why is everybody smiling and happy and doing these silly things that we're all expected to do? And when you logically look at them, there's, they're nonsensical. But if we quickly go through all my life from my 20s up and all the times I went back to school and all these things I did in the Marine Corps and my life as a stagehand, there came a point in the 90s where my whole life I'd wanted a telescope. And in the 90s, I finally took a credit card and I bought a very expensive telescope. It was an eight inch Mead, fully robotic tracking. So I finally had a good scope to look at the sky. And nice. what, I set, yeah, what I set about doing was taking a film camera. It was an Olympus film camera for all you kids listening who may not know what a film camera is. <laughs> you get a limited number of shots and you gotta wait to develop to see what you got. It's a lot of work, and I was trying to replicate what I was seeing come from the Hubble and swallowing wholesale uh, everything NASA had been handing me for the most part since I was a kid, since the moon nonsense. Um, and what I came to discover was you cannot even come close to imaging what they're producing, and I began to scrutinize what they were telling us, and I came to understand that those images were all constructs. I wasn't aware at the time that it's pretty likely there is no anything in what we call space, including a, a Hubble space telescope. It's all nonsense. Right. Um, but that's really where it was a final straw and there was going to be no more viewing anything as a gentleman. Um, from now on, everything that came to me was going to get challenged and I wasn't just going to be another smiling, you know, blind melon wandering through this world, accepting what I'm told. And once you get in the habit of, not believing all the nonsense we're told in a day. And believe me, 80 to 90% of what you are told in a day is nonsense. It is programming, it is homogenization, it is the, the destruction of variety in the human race. When you set about throwing everything away, including what is one plus one, and while that may sound silly to people, that's really where you go. One plus one is no longer two until I examine it and I decide, yes, I guess it is two, or no, there's no way in hell it's two. Just because I was told these numbers do this and they have values, it wasn't good enough for me anymore. After about a year, I don't know how to describe it, the chemistry of your brain or the person that you are, it switches and you no longer become reliant on this detail-oriented, fact-finding information mission, you start to get higher human ability where suddenly you can hear the ring of truth in a thing if you know nothing about it. And even though you don't get the details you want or all the reasons you would like to have, nonetheless, the ring of truth is not in it. And that is all you really need because you do not take a thing serious that has no ring of truth in it. And if you make this a habit in your life, it's the only way that I have figured out to describe to people how to get beyond or start to get beyond. I mean, I'm probably still wearing diapers. I'm sure I'm wearing diapers to get on the path to be beyond this illusion. That's really the only way I know how to describe it. So you've got this ring of truth, which I'll just extend the metaphor a little bit. This is kind of like navigating by sonar in a sense that now we're looking for signals that ring true. And as you're navigating through this whole gestalt process, um, did you go through a period of time of intense cognitive dissonance maybe in terms of if, again, you know, each person has this experience at a different level and from a different perspective because we're psychologically and even in terms of soul and spirit, very different beings. But for me personally, I went through levels of breakthroughs you know, like you from the time I was probably a teenager, then in my 20s, my 30s, and on and on. But I hit extreme troughs where 
there was this cognitive dissonance that set in it that, that as the Beatles so famously framed it, nothing is real. And you go through a period of time where you feel like you're navigating blind. Well, the Beatles were telling you the truth. The yeah. problem is, is that they didn't give us the context with which to decipher that line. Um, for someone to say, okay, nothing's real. I'm going to walk out in the street and I won't get hurt. That's not correct. A car is going to hit you and you're going to get hurt. That's real. Yeah. What's being referred to here is in need of context. And the first time that I was ever faced with this was in my early 20s when I went on a religion hunt. I said I was raised Christian and I started looking at Buddhism. I started looking at Hindu. I looked at all sorts of religions and I looked at them hard and I became to come to realizations. But I remember the first time that I read and I was reading a book from a supposed tolku. A tolku is a Tibetan master that's been reincarnated and recognized by their tradition. And he was talking about the illusion of this world. And he used a phrase that is so often used in Eastern religions, where this world is akin to a moon on a full moon on a dark night being reflected off the surface of a lake. The reflection you are seeing is no different than this world. In, the, in this teaching, and I'm not phrasing that 100% correct, but people can look that up and get the straight version because in Buddhism, it's used endlessly to, to use uh, um, uh, an analogy for illusion, the moon being reflected off a lake. And they're not talking just about the lake, they're talking about the moon, they're talking about it all. And when you start to say, okay, well, it's all an illusion, a Western mind wants to say, well, then it's all fake. Well, that's not what's being said here. What's being said here is that our mind creates our reality. Mind precedes everything. And so what your mind interprets becomes your reality. So if you've accepted this construct with which we are all in right now as something other than what it is, then you're living in an illusion. Then in a way you're asleep. In a way you're not grown up. In a way, I mean, you could go on and on and on, metaphors and analogies about a poor person who doesn't understand where they are. But here's the rub. 90 some percent of us don't understand where we are. I've spent my whole life looking and I, I still can't draw a map of where we are. Um, it's because we've been denied basic rights, birthrights, all of us. And it comes down to good information. What's happened, it appears, is that information has been wholly controlled for as long back as we can look. And the people who controlled that information painted a vastly different picture and then put all these constructs in place. Like in the modern age, it's media, it's TV, it's movies, which are just programming us all day long. I just did a show where I talked about uh, Star Trek. The, the key role of Star Trek, in my view, was to program us all on what we should mentally accept, the mental image of what space is, what this yeah. world looks like, what travel to a planet would be, what a spaceship, all these things that we've been told by NASA, which I accept none of. How can you? We've proved that they've lied on a scale that is unbelievable. It's, it's unconscionable, the scale that these people have lied to us. And when you've been lied to on that scale, the only sane response is I no longer accept anything you've ever said. And if you said a thing and I saw your lips move, it's likely you were lying because gentlemen days are gone. The people who are doing this are not gentlemen or gentlewomen. Um, there are people who take the word human race very literally. There are races or cultures that are going to race to the finish line. And they are bound and determined to have the best of everything, to have the control, to control the rest of us, to set the agendas, to, to dehumanize us, to make us more controllable, to limit variety within our cultures, which is done with media and movies and TVs and all these other things. And that was a bit of a ramble, and I'm not even sure where we started. Well, actually, you walked right into a whole series of things that were part of my my initial questioning around, because when we start to talk, well, you take Gene Roddenberry. Gene Roddenberry was part of a group called The Nine, which include a, a, a series of psychics that they use to uh, basically channel information. Um, Roddenberry was writing scripts that were basically being played out, as you pointed out. I think he interfaced at least on some level with what Kubrick was doing as well and with 2001. It looks like, you know, it looks like that late 60s period was when the pump got primed for all of this because 
that's when you see, uh, well, obviously the, the alleged moon landing. Uh, we've gone through Gemini and Apollo, and we have the moon landing, and then we have the advent of Star Trek, which is in 1966. We have 2001, A Space Odyssey with Kubrick, which some believe was simply the offshoot of the technology used to create the moon landing effects. But we have this vestigial period in the late 1960s where the groundwork is laid for our concepts of space. I mean, I grew up with my earliest memories of space being Sputnik and this idea that we put these satellites up around the planet. That's your earliest thing. So all of this was creating an imaginarium for us to then project out this, this concept of, quote, outer space and man's place in taking his rightful ascendancy into the stars, as it were. But in all of this, what we didn't see was the magician behind the window. What we saw was the TV presentations, the narratives that were given, and the psychology or the, um, the science. And this is where it really gets tricky. The science that we were being taught in the schools then. What do you see in terms of the perceptual level of people today of bouncing off of this mind control system that they created? Because re the science itself has gridlocked us into a, a three-dimensional landscape where we're navigating based on their boundaries, their parameters, and their definitions of things. Well, I mean, you could use an analogy like maybe if we took the human body and we said one arm represents spiritual endeavors, one arm represents the religion you choose to follow or whatever higher spiritual belief, one leg is science, and then maybe another leg is math. Um, what basically science has done is convinced us we only need one or two leg, one or two limbs on the human body. And unfortunately, the ones that we're going to ignore seemingly are the most important. And this is what primes the trap. Um, they whip out all this fancy math of why a rocket does what a rocket does. They whip out all these orbital mechanics. They've got all this physics and all this other stuff that is basically spellcraft because it's designed to do what it does. But here's the rub. The rub is that damn spellcraft gave us a refrigerator and that's a handy damn thing to have in the modern age. That spellcraft gave us a car to drive, which opens up our ability to move or to fly. So it really is an insidious thing. While we have to have it, it has also been presented to us in a way where we're ignoring truly the higher human abilities. If you examine children that were born in the mid 90s, um, and my wife and I were just talking about this yesterday and we have nephews, you will see in a lot of cases, children who have abilities that far surpass yes. what, their par yeah. Yeah, what their parents have managed to accrue in a lifetime. As an example, I have a nephew. When he was two or three, I bought him a Magna Doodle and I drew a face and I saw the expression change when he understood that I could put these marks on a thing that he recognized as a face. By the time he was 18, eight years old, I could no longer keep up with him drawing. And right now he's about like Leonardo da Vinci. And I'm not kidding. He can replicate uh, at the highest illustration levels anything he sees and he does it very quickly. His brother is a case in point too where he picked up piano. I think he learned it in six months and it is unbelievable what the kid can play. We're seeing all this acceleration. A lot of people like to attribute it to the information age and maybe there's some there's there's got to be something to that. It's part of our environment. But I would point out when all us sap suckers we're back in the 60s staring at our black and white TVs watching the moon landing. We got one shot at it. We didn't really have a way to review it or, or, or record it or study right. it. It was images that we were accepting being proud of our nation is another ingredient. Everyone was proud of America as this was going on. So it's a whole contextual mindset. And once it goes by, it's gone. We're not getting another look at that till they choose to show us again. We get up to the information age. Guess what, guys? We can take every pixel, frame image anything you have ever said and I can put it on my monitor and I can take it apart till the cows come home. Um, that's part of it, but clearly there's something else going on. I marked the time around 2009 when I really saw a lot of people realizing that what we've been told is not good enough anymore. And part of it was 
Sandy Hook played a, a huge role. Yes. Um, it was so poorly executed that so many people who accidentally saw the video telling you why it was false realized all of a sudden, holy smokes, could my government do this to me? Once you get to an adult mind and you realize your government did do that to you, well, what does that tell you about everything else your government has done ever? It brings it into question. And so, you know, th this is the way that I have seen things gone. And the reason that I do my show, I was just talking with my wife about this yesterday as well, is I don't know how far I can get. I don't know how long my content will be allowed to be out there. I assume some of it will probably make it past me because people have downloaded it. So maybe when I'm wherever the hell we go from here, um, some of those clips will still be around. The idea for me is to point out what I can see so clearly so that the next people who probably are going to have more abilities than I did because they're younger than I am and they're in this whatever it is, this quickening that we're all going through, I don't know a better word for it, they'll it's go a, a little bit further. And maybe the people who come after them will pick up what's been left. And maybe there's a road not too many generations in the future where jackasses who want to limit variety and turn us all into animal form won't have the same abilities they once did because too many people will simply have woken up and opted out of it. And, you know, that's kind of the way I see it. It's interesting because what I'm noticing right now is we're now in another acceleration pattern. Um, since the beginning of this year, I've had family members. My, to understand how I'm viewed within my family is largely, oh, let's go ask the crazy brother or the crazy cousin. Because I grew up basically as, a, as an outcast in my own family who thought I was certifiably nuts for reasons that I won't recount in this show, but some of the listeners are aware of or will be. The, the bottom line is that now people are coming to me, they're sending me pictures of chemtrails, and they're going, can you explain this? And I'm like, sure, be glad to explain this. Here's what it is, boom, 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 you know, uh, barium, aluminum, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, biological material, uh, NASA, terraforming weather, here's a video, go look at it, get back to me with questions. Uh, was, I, I'm seeing this more and more in my micro universe, and I'm seeing it in the macro universe in terms of the fact that whatever you think about this last election cycle that America went through, one thing is very clear. The media is fucking broken and they can't fix it. They're limping around right now on a wagon with three wheels and they have no idea how to get their credibility back. Well, let, 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 me, let me address that for Go a second. For it. Um, I'm producing a show today, which we'll post today or tomorrow that I did with Jason. It's episode 45 on Crow Triple Seven Radio. We demonstrate that sometime around 1998, there were what was called the big five or the big six, which owned it all. And we're talking all, all media, all television, all movie theaters or movie production houses, many movie theaters, um, record labels where all the music comes from, newspapers, yep. media across the world. By the time we get to 2013, we're at the big two. Okay. What this tells us is that this, it's not even an idea. This thing that we're talking about, which is full spectrum programming, demonstrates that single entities own it all and that they're coordinating the message across all of it. We could go and give details, but when you look at the media today and we start to get the mindset of, well, they wish they could get their credibility back. They wish we could do any number of things. If the media, if you're thinking of the media in this way, let me rephrase. The media was put there to do what it's doing. There will never be a time when the idea of the fourth estate that we were sold in school is true or was true. It was always there to do what it, what it wanted to do. And at any time, if it threatened the powers that be, it would have been shut down, even if we were to go back to the 60s when supposedly 50 corporations owned all the news and not just two. Um, my point here is that we exist within a system. A system is designed by people. A system that is designed by people is intended to have an effect, an outcome. It's intended to do something. So the very fact that you can examine your surroundings and understand that you know in a system automatically tells you that someone designed it. It doesn't tell you who, but it also tells you that there is an expected outcome to a design system. When you begin to know these things, you start to understand all you need to know to begin to latch onto your higher mind 
and not be subject to so much of the nonsense all the time. Do you believe that we're seeing that begin to take hold on a wider scale? Because my point wasn't so much, I agree with you, that, that this was always a monolithic structure. You know, the pretense, it's like the computer industry. I, I, I've been in the tech industry as long as there's been a tech industry. I saw what happened when computers, the, the, the version of computers that are consumer products happened. I mean, in the beginning, you had dozens of different computer companies you had at least a half dozen operating systems running. People don't remember CPM and older operating systems that preceded DOS. Don't know the history of the legacy of Unix operating system. The fact that, you know, there were dozens of companies competing and in the end we folded it down. We wound up with, with Microsoft and Apple as the dominant forces right. in computers. Right. You know, monolithically, Apple and, and, and Microsoft are very much in bed with each other despite pretense of competition. There's discernibly almost no difference between the platforms anymore. No, because they, they have to get away from the idea that someone could scream monopoly, which they did at one point with, uh, with PCs and browsers. Right, right. Um, what you're looking at is the consolidation of power. I was yeah. actually in the early internet bubble and thought I might end up getting wealthy. Yeah. Was getting stock <laughs> options. I was getting stock options and I was in a company that was doing at least as good as any competitor. What happened is they went south, got bought out, and the competitors that we had became the monoliths, uh, which are no different than PC or Mac. And so what you're looking at is corporate mergers. That's what goes on, or corporate buyouts. Every time you see a large corporate merger, I talk about this in the show that's about to post on my podcast, you're looking at the consolidation of power. You're looking at the bank idea of too big to fail. Of course, that one has a cute marketing moniker that gets us all to agree that, yeah, these banks can do whatever the F they want because they're too big to fail. Well, that's nonsense. That's a marketing ploy made up in a dark room somewhere that is covering the fact that every time these corporations, big corporations merger, we get closer to the big one where one corporation owns it all. And then when you have that, what, man? You're gonna try to get a hacksaw and scrub on the bars around you at that point? It gets much more difficult the further we get down the road. But the good news is this. This whole system appears to be based on opt-in. In other words, if you want to act like a child and be fooled into doing things that are not helpful, um, you're going to opt into this system. And unfortunately, there are a hell of a lot of us now that are being fooled. If you call yourself a Democrat or Republican, guess yep. what? Yep. You're being fooled. You have been conditioned to opt into a construct. And that's just one of many examples. And so when we look at this as, as a factual, logical thing we can examine, we suddenly understand, I don't have to opt into any of this. I understand taxes are legal. They're not legal. They were implemented illegally. What's being done with it, none of it. It's all based on a straw man, bizarre law system that I won't even get into right here. Point is, is the day we wake up and enough of us have come to this realization and say, I'm not doing that anymore. Things change in a big way because these are the self-imposed bars we've been allowed we have all allowed to be put around us. When someone says, I don't need permission to marry anyone, I don't need a license from the damn town, exactly. I don't need to pay taxes to a federal government who's lying about everything, I don't need to participate in the straw man corporate identity that is my birth certificate, I don't need these things, that's how change occurs. And really, for my money, the only way that will ever occur is when enough people have become aware that the illusion that's been spun around them is not really how it has to be. All right, well, I'm gonna jump in here for, you guys have just spewed out so many things. <laughs> I have all sorts of thoughts and <laughs> go for things it, in my head. I'm gonna rewind and hit on some things for first. First, I wanna go all the way back to your reference to that Buddhist thing about the, the moon and the lake. Um, I find it, I just have to point out that I find it fascinating that that was so revelatory to you. And then you jumped into people's consciousness by showing an image of the moon with what, and we now, when, you know, many people are now coming to understand and believe is a ripple of water flowing over it. So you're talking about the reflection of the moon in the lake being illusory. And then you're, you kind of pop into prominence showing a ripple over the moon and, and the illusion that that is. Um, so I find that very interesting. Um, 
it's hard to know if we're all here to do what we're all here to do. I mean, I don't know how matrix this actually goes. Um, you know, it wouldn't <laughs> surprise me to understand we're all laying on a table somewhere, but I don't see any direct evidence for it. But it's quite possible that all these little things that we do in our lifetime, the cause and effects runs much further than we think. Yeah. And, you know, maybe it's just not knowable right now, whether we're making our own bed or whether our bed's been made for us. Well, I'm just like, I, I guess for me, kind of like where I'm at with my own inner stuff and my own inner spirituality, like this is the kind of thing that, what is this, are you, I mean, like is this, was that you back then? And is this the modern iteration in this lifetime of you trying to, you know, we're dealing with the technological thing where we view and films that th things through film they didn't back then. So are you trying to present maybe the same message that, that a version of you was trying to present back then? You know what I mean? Like I, 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 these things are just fascinating to me. Like I wonder if we go through our different lifetimes trying, you know, to, trying to accomplish the same task, trying to get the same message out and just having to find new ways to do it. I just find that, that very interesting. I hadn't heard you say that story, say that story before. Um, well, there's, there's one thing that I think is probably very likely very true is that each of us has been denied the understanding of how much a difference a single person can make. Yeah. Um, if you just look at the lunar wave, I filmed that by accident. At first, I almost deleted the clip. It took me a period of time to start to begin to understand what it might mean. But now fast forward to where we are, there's not a country with an internet connection in the world, as far as I know, that does not understand that the words lunar wave are in our lexicon. Um, so it just goes to show that any person who wants to really focus and shut off the TV and ignore <coughs> the election cycle and just shut out this illusory nonsense that's put around us and focus on a thing, you really can't have quite a large effect on this world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, so, okay. Well, and then I think that the, so a lot of people, people noticed you for the lunar wave and, and I uh, enjoy that stuff, but I have a limited amount of interest at spending time looking at, you know, pictures of the moon and things like that. And the thing you really, you know, that really caught me about you. I mean, I liked a lot of the stuff you were doing, but when I heard you say belief is the enemy of knowing, it crystallized the, what had been going around, what, what I had been thinking in my mind for several years at that point, but I didn't have like a term for. And so it's interesting that we find, you know, I found out about you from the lunar wave and then you drop that level of knowledge and wisdom, which is the same thing people say about these Buddhist, uh, you know, metaphors and whatnot. So, um, yeah, one person can have a huge difference. I mean, I like, you know, like when, when I heard you say that, I was like, oh, wow, that was a very revelatory uh, point for me. You know, I mean, I knew that, but the, I, it wasn't, that crystallization is so important, you know, because otherwise sometimes you just have all these ideas flying around in your head. That well, then, like, then you can logically blow that out. You know, I say a yeah. thing, that thing means something to you. How many people have you touched since you decided that thing meant something to you? How many people have those touched? Yeah. How many other people are like you who saw that and it resonated with them in some way? And that's really, you know, the old Buddhist metaphor again of throwing a rock into a lake and the ripples cover the whole lake. Um, you know, that's really what goes on. And we don't get a true picture from the media sources. Um, according to YouTube, I've lost something like 30,000 subscribers over the life of my YouTube channel. I would suggest to you that it is probably far more likely that if you took the amount of subscribers that are admitted to and multiplied by 10 or something like that, you'd be a hell of a lot closer to the amount of people who have been touched here. And the real truth is, is even if we rely on the stats, we don't have really any way to gauge it. And they, you know, the information sources are controlled, but for each person who finds value in a the thing, they touch people. Of the people who find value in that same thing, we start to create these ripples. And that's what I'm pointing out here is one person can have a drastic effect. And it's not clear to me whether when I wrote those words that I was making them up for myself or for some reason they're in the mental consciousness. I don't know. But when I understood what I was writing, I decided that I didn't know a truer thing to write. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. I think it's a, it's, it's actually a way of crystallizing and making into a tight nugget the same concept that that, that, that Buddhist uh, metaphor was about. 
and, and, and you know, I think that is, um, I think one of the most important things in this process is sort of distilling things down so people can understand them simply. And I think that the, the, when you do that, you're able to reach way more people with it. And I've said that to a mil that belief is the enemy of knowing. When I try to explain to people, because I'm done with, you know, people in general that I meet on a day-to-day -day basis who don't know a lot about me, I'm done trying to give them the full background on why I think what I think and why I, you know, opt out, as you would say. But when I tell them that belief is the en enemy of knowing, whether they agree with me or that or not, they understand what I'm talking about. And so they can either choose to be, you know, to talk to me about something further or not. But that pretty much, you know what I mean? Like they understand what I'm saying when I say that. And so that, that's, you well, know, you're, yeah. you're, you're basically installing resonance patterns. That's yeah. really all we're doing. And the first <laughs> resonance pattern comes with us to us. So that, you know, the lunar, the lunar wave thing was, was crow's truth put out there. And then what followed that were repeated building on of, of, of these resonance patterns, which, yeah. you know, Crow, you got, you got major interest in your work. Weren't you, weren't you hit up by some major media to use some of your materials? Yeah, it, it happens every few months. Um, I don't know how much it will happen anymore because I think Prometheus was the last people who came to me and I basically told them I'm not impressed. Um, and not only am I not impressed, I'm not entering into contracts with people I'm not impressed by. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not impressed with ancient aliens. I had a producer actually call me and his selling point was, is he had produced ancient aliens. And I said, well, then you and I live in different universes because I view that <laughs> program as one of the most unhelpful kinds yes. of nonsense yeah. that you can ever perpetrate on people acting like there's all this evidence for a thing that has no evidence. Um, it's, it's, it's no different, you know, it's, it's a bit like so many of the constructs of this world where much of what the constructs we willingly join take our power from us. And there are so many things that do this. Um, and I usually don't bring up religion at all because I think people are entitled to worship in any way they want. I've spent major portions of my life um, learning religions and comparing what they are saying and other things. But there is a lot of religious attitude out there where people are surrendering the power that if they choose to believe in a God, then they could say God gave me because they've been told they can't do anything without the help of another. And I'm here to tell you that every human being you will ever see in your life has every tool in the toolbox needed to become a higher being. And the idea that some priest, some intercessor, some deity or some anything needs to come down here to do it for you, to me, is simply convincing people to surrender their power that they don't have these abilities. The truth is, is human beings have very vast abilities. And I've said in many, many interviews, it would not surprise me to learn. And actually, from having assessed what I, what I look at, uh, I think it's very likely that the people who pull the strings on this planet are almost a different species. Because as most of us have de-evolved, ate crappy food, ate crappy, drank crappy water, um, all the things, you know, the medicine and the inoculations and all the things that we think are normal life, they were doing something else. They were spiritually advancing, although that may be the dark side of the force, hard to tell looks that way um they you know like the the story of the party the, the controlling party in china taking all the organic food so that the party members get nothing but organic food it's this kind of an idea where people who understood more readily what this place we live in is they took measures to consolidate power to increase their own human abilities and then to impose on the rest of us the things that were not helpful but the real shame here is we all agreed to do it and we didn't have to. Um, it's almost like the people who control things will never set a trap that is completely 100% blind. They will temp temporarily tip their hand in encoded ways or not obvious ways that this thing is about to happen. They will do all these things for an adult mind to recognize, I probably shouldn't put my foot right there because there's a bear trap. Um, the other people who don't understand this have a whole other mental process going on. They think putting their foot there is normal. They don't notice as the trap shuts on them and they walk through life this way. Yeah. And they're, and they're, and they're proud of it too. You know what I mean? Like I was, it's, you know, I was, when you were saying that, I was just thinking of 
um, someone I know who's very intelligent, but you know, in, in a lot of ways, but I remember one time having a conversation with them about flu shot and about how ridiculous, you know, how crazy it was and how the flu shot causes the flu and how much evidence there is for that. And she just said, well, I don't care if the doctor tells me to take it, I'll take it. And she sounded like she felt superior to me for saying that, you know what I mean? Like I was some silly person who questions things. This is not a dumb person, but behaving dumb. You know what I mean? And it, it, the, the pride that people take in set, setting their foot in the trap and then, like, oh, I'm trapped. It's almost like well, they like it. Look at that example right there. There's an authoritarian figure that sits in the background. It's very Orwellian. It's telling you, do this, do that, because I'm the expert, you're the subject. And it's exactly what we see in the entire paradigm, whether it's religion or science or politics, where some authority figure is lording over us what we're supposed to do with our biological entity, what we're supposed to do with our politics, our sexuality, it doesn't even matter what the subject is. We're not really supposed to exercise free will control over much of anything. Well, I, I, there, there is no doubt that we, at least in the Western world, in the places that I am familiar with, the vast majority of us were raised since we were babies that you trust your doctor when he has medical advice. You trust your scientist. It's even codified in popular entertainment. Look at Gilligan's Island. I've used sure. it a lot of times. The professor's the guy who's going to handle the science. The skipper gets to make all the decisions because, of course, he's practicing admiralty law. He's the skipper. <laughs> um, the rich guy, Howell, does whatever the hell he wants, and people must do what he says because he's the rich guy, Howell. And, of course, the girls are going to be there to make the coconut cream pies and do the laundry. This is programming, reinforcing the fact that we've all been brought up um, in this trust environment. And so it's the wrong context. The correct context is an adult human being challenges everything. 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 If I don't care, I, I mean, I can't think of an example of anything coming to you where you should not already be looking at it critically to see if it has value. And this is not what we're taught in our society. We are taught that when you go to the doctor and he says, take this purple pill, you do it because the doctor told you. Well, guess what? Yeah. I'm in a whole other universe. Purple pill for what? Yeah, it's it? yeah. Yeah, it's a whole doctor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's doctor. It. yeah. yeah. That's exactly. <laughs> ask, your, ask your doctor if you can treat yourself to a medicine you know nothing about yeah, yeah make sure you ask your doctor before you fire up that next next uh toke because well, i guess you want to make sure it's medical marijuana too right, right, right yeah i guess i i don't know i i was one of those people i've never liked the doctor never trusted the doctor been you know scared of the doctor since i was little you know what i mean so it's something inside of me always said eh -eh, eh -eh, white coat doesn't mean anything or at least nothing good um Okay, you also, Crow, you hit on like a bunch of stuff in the succession that like I'm having trouble. I, okay, I was going to go back to some of it, but now I think maybe we should just move forward. One of, the, one of the main things that has been coming up over and over for Randy and I lately in our private conversations and in, with some others we've had on the show, but we've, we've really been looking forward to delving into this with you, um, you know, because you've been talking, you had several podcasts in a row recently where you were talking about, you know, space being fake, the moon being the place where no one has gone, space being a mental implant, all that kind of thing. And we have been talking a lot about lately. I just, I came to the realization, again, it was one of these things, like I understood this before, but I crystallized it recently to this whole, you know, we, we, our wheelhouse is the mind, mind control stuff and MK Ultra. That's the, mostly what we deal with. And such a big thing that's being pushed in that arena the last couple of years has been the secret space program and something about it. Well, I understand that there's like a certain kind of thing. It, it, it matters. Like a, there's something about it that is a real thing. I never bought, I, I never bought all this stuff that quote unquote whistleblowers were present. Like it just didn't resonate for me in the way that it should for me to think of it as something that is real. And then I also, understand encoding and language and the things like you know like you spend so much time talking about and i just had that aha moment about six months back where the secret is that there's no space it's just a program 
And when I had that moment, it was like, uh, you know, like, oh, okay. I mean, I, I understood that on a certain level, but again, when you crystallize the idea, what do you think about that? What do you think about the secret space program? Do you think I have that read of the encoding right? Well, and, I mean, words have meaning, don't they? It's like yeah. when people, people understand that the media is not what they thought, but they'll still watch KPBS for the public programming. Right. <laughs> <laughs> words have meaning, um, yeah. you know, and it, we're not guaranteed that the words will be used appropriately each time. But these were, you know, you, you want to hear a secret space program. Well, who, who probably uttered those first words? Well, I'll tell you the guys who probably uttered those first words were the guys who had the secrets they didn't want out. If it was truly a secret space program, you would never know anything about it. Right? Yeah. Um, we can take apart so much of the construct that's been handed us. Um, we can do these things. The problem here is, is belief. Belief will always be the problem. Once you enter into belief, often with no research or anything more than making the decision, I'm going to believe this thing, it becomes very difficult to unbelieve a thing. And so what we see is so many people, you know, are, are like me or like you. At some point, they believed we went to the moon. At some point, they believed. But to get a person to make the, the leap that maybe I should not be believing this thing, maybe I should take a closer look at this thing, let's face it, there's gonna be a huge majority of people out there who are just not ready to do that thing. Um, but I think we can demonstrate that what we've been told about space is not true, and the idea of a secret space program to me is laughable, because to talk about a thing, you have to have evidence for a thing, some kind of you know, real evidence. And what we actually have is lie after lie after lie about international space stations, which is basically a thinly veiled reference to ISIS. We have shows like Star Trek, which painted the picture for us while it was encoding the Club 33 fingerprint on the Enterprise Hall, which also adds up to 9-11, I would add. I mean, you can see the construct of it all. Um, is there a secret space program? Well, I guess I can't say I know that for sure, but what I can say is there's no evidence for a secret space program. And if there was, then why wouldn't we have satellites and all these other things that are claimed? Uh, so uh, so I, think there, I think there is a secret space program, but it has nothing to do with outer space or anything like that. I think that, let me see if I'm gonna do my best to flesh this out and explain it sort of fully, because I really may wanna to pull this over into the next segment too. <laughs> um, because this goes into another area that I think we want to, we, we want to be able to unpack. So okay. uh, let me do this. Let's, let's call segment here. Let's take a break. This will be the free hour you'll see on YouTube. Um, they're all free right now, by the way, but you're going to have to go over to offplanetradio.com to get the full treatment. We'll do that. We'll come back on the other side of Off Planet Radio with our guest Crow Triple Seven and with Emily Moyer, I'm Randy Moggins. And we will be right back. Thank you. 